Okay, it's amazing to be here. I'm Josh Tendenbaum, and I'm gonna be talking about scaling AI the human way. I am a cognitive scientist, and I'm also an AI engineer, and both sides of our work are motivated by this question. Why do we have this boom in AI technologies, but no real AI? Increasingly, we have amazing machines that do things we used to think only humans could do. But none of them are truly intelligent. None of them really have common sense. Each of them has to be built by really smart engineers, and each does just one thing. So I want to know, what's missing? What would it take to build a machine with the kind of flexible, general-purpose intelligence of a human that each of you has to learn for yourselves each of these things, and infinitely more? So it won't be a surprise now to hear that what I think <laughs> is that the answer comes from what you just heard from my colleagues, Laura Schultz, Rebecca Sachs, and the whole fields they represent, much broader fields. Imagine if we could build a machine that grows into intelligence the way a human being does, that starts like a baby and learns like a child. Now that would be AI that is really intelligent, if we could build it. Do you think we could? Probably not in 10 years. <sighs> Almost certainly not. Probably not even in 20. Quite possibly not even in our lifetimes, but that's okay. That's why we call it a quest. And like any good quest, it's not so important when or even whether you get to the end. It's what you discover along the way. And one thing we've discovered along the way is that even small steps towards this goal can be big. So let me take you back one more time to the history of deep learning. Consider the math, the mathematics of deep learning and reinforcement learning was introduced in these papers, published decades ago in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. They were published mostly in journals of psychology or cognitive science as models of human learning. Each of these papers at the time was a small step, a very simple model, but it turns out that these small steps, when engineered at scale, that's become today's AI that's transforming our world. So think what we could do with just a few small steps towards this goal. Now, as you've already heard, the idea of building AI, machines that learn like a child, is perhaps the oldest idea in AI. Again, let's go back in history. Alan Turing introduced this idea in the same paper in 1950 when he introduced the Turing test. It was championed by Marvin Minsky when he started the AI lab at MIT, and Patrick Winston, longtime director of the AI lab, and many others, for good reason, because it's the only known scaling path in the, in the universe. <laughs> Human children are the only system we know that demonstrably, reliably, and reproducibly grows into human-level intelligence. So why not build AI this way? Well, why haven't we yet? Well, again, as I think you've already heard, in some sense, I think it's only now that the field, the science of human learning, is mature enough that it can offer some useful guidance to AI. And maybe AI is mature enough to know what to do with it. And I think it could be extremely valuable. So if we go back to Turing here, right, Turing could only presume what a child's brain was like, and he presumed wrong. He said, maybe it's like a notebook that you buy from the stationer. Rather little mechanism, lots of blank sheets. But what you've just seen, right, is that babies start out with so much more. And children's learning is so much more than just copying down what a teacher writes on the blackboard. So my part in this quest is trying to capture these insights in engineering. And we start with the most basic common sense that's in every young child, but no AI. So the intuitive physics, for example, when a kid is playing with blocks or stacking at cups like this. Imagine if we could build a robot to do that. <laughs> or the intuitive psychology, when someone to, that, let, that lets young kids, like the one in the back corner here in this classic experiment, figure out what someone is doing and why, what their goal is, even when performing an action they've never seen. These kids in these videos are just one and a half years old, but watch what this kid does here. And imagine if we could build a robot with this kind of common sense, this intelligence, this skill and helpfulness that could help you out around the house. Yeah, that would be amazing, okay? So in my group, we're trying to develop the tools that could someday make this possible. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. One is that we use new AI technologies called probabilistic programs that our group helped to invent along with many others in AI. These combine deep learning's ability to see patterns and data with other great AI ideas that don't fit yet in today's neural networks. So symbols for representing real knowledge, not just patterns. Causal reasoning, not just statistical inference or correlation. And hierarchical inference for learning to learn. So knowledge builds progressively, and learning makes you smarter at learning new things. Some of the abilities, just some of the abilities that Laura showed us, make kids the smartest learners in the universe. Or if you want to capture the common sense that even the youngest babies start out with, we use another kind of program that you might not have thought of as AI. 
So these are video game engines, programs for writing video games, physics engines to simulate a player's real-time interaction with a 3D world of objects, or graphics engines to render the viewpoint as a player moves around, or planning engines to model the non-player characters of the game. These engines, we think, may be something like the software description of the high-level brain architectures that Rebecca finds is built into babies' brains, where kids start in learning. So with these tools in our lab and with many collaborators, we've built something that we call, for instance, an intuitive physics engine to explain how your brain can answer an endless range of questions about a physical scene like these blocks here without any special training. Which way will the blocks fall? Or so rather, let's start, will the blocks fall? Which ones of these, of these scenes are more likely to fall than others? How confident are you? Our model can predict that. If they do fall, which way will they fall? How far will they fall? What if I tell you that the gray stuff is 10 times heavier than the green stuff? Or what about in these scenes? Is red or yellow heavier, given that these towers appear surprisingly stable? Our system can answer, like your brain, questions you've never thought about before for which you don't have the data needed for pattern recognition, but you do have a causal model. In other work, a lot of this started in collaboration with Rebecca. We've built what we call an intuitive psychology engine, or a model of theory of mind. This is a model of how agents plan actions based on their beliefs and desires to maximize expected utility. It's what Laura called the naive utility calculus that together we have studied in young children. Here, goals give rewards, while physics determines costs. And this model, we think in your brain, can let you observe someone's actions, like this woman here, and compute her goals. When can you tell what she's reaching for? I think maybe just about now. That's what our model predicts also. The same system can explain how you might compute in this scene in the lower left that one person is helping another person, while the next scene here is not helping, but quite the opposite, what we call hindering. And recently, we're excited that these same kind of systems give some of the first quantitatively testable models of young children's common sense, it, sorry, the youngest babies. So we test infants, intuitive physics, 12-month-olds in scenes like this. Objects are bouncing around, and when an object appears, that might be a little bit surprising like this one, infants will look longer at it. And our model can predict quantitatively how long infants look at an object based on how probable it is under our model's computations. Or we can study here the intuitive psychology of even younger mm. babies with cartoons like this. The more work a character is willing to do, the more cost they're willing to pay to achieve a goal, jumping over a wall, well, mm. which they didn't do before, but which they're about to do here, that tells you how much an agent wants something. And it's not just jumping over a wall, it's rolling up or down a hill, leaping across a gap. The more, you, the more you see an agent work, the more you think it wants that goal. Our model predicts that quantitatively, and it turns out infants do too. So we can capture some of what babies know at 10 months or 12 months, a little bit, of how they use their intuitive physics or their intuitive psychology to learn about new objects or agents. But how does a baby build these engines in the first place? That's the real learning problem. Evolution might have given us something like a proto game engine in your head, but learning for a baby then means learning to program those engines to describe the game of your life. Learning algorithms really have to be programming algorithms. We need program learning programs. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we like to call this the hard problem of learning because it's really, really hard. <laughs> it's much harder than learning in neural networks where you have a smooth error landscape and you're just following the gradient to roll downhill until you hit bottom, the point in weight space with the lowest error. The space of programs has no such nice, simple geometry, and you have a really hard search problem, but somehow children solve it. So to try to understand how they solve it and build machines that might learn programs, we've been working on an easier warm-up problem of how people learn the programs that capture simple visual concepts, such as a new tool or a new handwritten character. So you can learn the concept of a cam, it's a piece of rock climbing equipment, down in the lower left there, and pick out the other cams, like this. Likewise, you can learn any of thousands of new handwritten characters, even in alphabets you've never seen before. You don't need hundreds or thousands of examples like a deep learning system, you just need one. Now we can capture this ability in machines with something called Bayesian program learning, another kind of probabilistic program, where you have a mental model of the causal processes that produce ink on the page, like the motor programs or action. It's a probabilistic program that captures the different ways characters can be drawn, and you can invert it using a kind of Bayes rule to work backwards to figure out what action sequence is most likely to have produced it. That's your concept, and you can use it to imagine other instances of the same character. So see it in action here with a little kind of Turing test. We asked both our machine and people, given just one example to imagine other instances of the same character, can you tell which is the human or the machine? Anybody think they can get them here in each of these six cases? Here's the right answer. Did anybody get them all right? 
Yeah, probably most of you got about three right, I think. Basically, people can't tell. We've passed a very simple Turing test in concept learning, in very simple concept learning. Pretty cool, We're, we like it, but it's just, a, of course, a small step. Could this scale up to learn all the knowledge that a child acquires over her lifetime? Well, we've recently made another small step towards this goal with a new form of Bayesian program learning, inspired by some of the science showing that some of the deepest learning underlying children's everyday activities, like, the, like these, might not happen during the day, but during the night, while you're asleep. So inspired by consolidation and replay during human sleep, our dream coder algorithm learns to learn new programs to get better and faster each day by abstracting out the most central concepts from what it learned while it was awake, and then testing out and practicing these in its dreams to get better the next day. This system might be able to discover on its own whole new libraries of concepts, each like its own programming language. Will this be the answer to AI's oldest dream? A machine that truly learns like a child? Probably not, almost certainly not. But it might be the next small step. Could it be the next form of deep learning? Deeper learning? Might be, stay tuned, we're just at the beginning. But we're at the end of this first session, kicking off the intelligence quest. And I just wanna close by coming back to the moonshot slide that Jim showed you at the start and leave you with a few thoughts. First, what I told you about here is just a little about just one of these projects. We're just scratching the surface. And you can see that the work we do, even in this one project, touches on all these big questions. And it touches deeply on both science and engineering. That's just in the nature of intelligence and why we're so excited to be kicking off this big initiative that brings together so many of the students and faculty across MIT and what they're excited about. But most of all, notice on this slide, there's so much that isn't on there yet. The dot, dot, dots on the bottom are the most important part, even if they're the smallest. <laughs> and we're just at the beginning of each of these questions. So if you feel like these questions might be your questions, or even better, if you know where the dots are going, I hope you'll join us on this quest. Please join us.